world a stranger Such a babe in such a place Can he be the Savior As the saved of all the race Who have found his favor Angels sang about his birth Wise men sought and found him. Heaven star shone brightly forth, glory all around them. Shepherds saw the wondrous sight, heard the angels singing. All the plains were lit that night, all the hills were child lowly in a manger he is still the undefiled but no more a stranger son of god of humble birth beautiful the story praise his name in all the earth hail the king of glory morning. Welcome to worship here at St. Paul's this morning. Our Lord comes to save us just as he promised. He comes as the virgin-born son of David, who is also the son of God, Emmanuel, God with us. And today we'll especially rejoice in the fact that our Lord has blessed us with a Holy Spirit-given faith that believes in that promise of salvation. Our worship today starts with the Advent gathering rite that we've been using for the last number of weeks. I invite you to please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. We light the fourth candle on our wreath, which represents peace. We remember the people of Israel and the great peace they experienced when the longed-for Messiah appeared. In the words of the psalmist, we speak of the peace that is ours through Christ, even as we watch and wait for the joyous day when he will come again. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning. O Israel, put your hope in the Lord. For with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption.
Advent tells us to be watchful for his coming, keeping our lamps lighted and our hearts clean. Therefore, let us confess to the Lord. God and Father of all, we prepare our hearts for the coming of your Son, confessing our sins, confessing our attraction to a godless world that does not know Christ. Forgive our sins, cleanse our hearts, and keep us faithful for the promised coming of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. God sent his son, the babe of Bethlehem, to show his infinite love and forgiveness for all. Your sins are forgiven in the holy name of Christ, who came and will come again. Amen. Stir up your power, O Lord, and come. Take away the burden of our sins and make us ready for the celebration of your birth that we may receive you in joy and serve you always. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Our Lord promised that our Savior would come as the virgin-born son of David. Today in the first lesson from God's word, we hear the prophecy, a prophecy that Isaiah made 700 years before the fact about that virgin birth of our Savior. A lesson from Isaiah chapter 7. When Ahaz, son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, was king of Judah, King Rezin of Aram and Pekah, son of Remaliah, king of Israel, marched up to fight against Jerusalem, but they could not overpower it. Now the house of David was told, Aram has allied itself with Ephraim. So the hearts of Ahaz, king of Judah, and his people were shaken, as the trees of the forest were shaken by the wind. Then the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out, you and your son, Shear Jashub, to meet Ahaz at the end of the aqueduct of the upper pool on the road to the launderer's field. Say to him, be careful, keep calm, and don't be afraid. Do not lose heart because of these two smoldering stubs of firewood, because of the fierce anger of Rezin and Aram, and of the son of Remaliah. Aram, Ephraim, and Remaliah's son have plotted your ruin, saying, Let us invade Judah, let us tear it apart, and divide it among ourselves, and make the son of Tabil king over it. Yet this is what the Sovereign Lord says. It will not take place, it will not happen, for the head of Aram is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is only resin. Within 65 years, Ephraim will be too shattered to be a people. The head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is only Remaliah's son. If you do not stand firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. Again, the Lord spoke to King Ahaz. Ask the Lord your God for a sign 
whether in the deepest depths or in the highest heights. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, I will not put the Lord to the test. Then Isaiah said, Hear now, you house of David. Is it not enough to try the patience of humans? Will you try the patience of my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. He will be eating curds and honey when he knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right. For before the boy knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right, the land of the two kings you dread will be laid waste. The Lord will bring on you and on your people and on the house of your father a time unlike any since Ephraim broke away from Judah. He will bring the king of Assyria. This is the word of the Lord. In the second lesson from God's word, which is before us this morning, we, along with the apostle Paul, rejoice in God's promises of salvation which have been fulfilled in Jesus. This second lesson are the opening verses of Romans chapter 1. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God, the gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets and the holy scriptures regarding his son, who as to his earthly life was a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the Son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through him we have received grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith for his name's sake. And you also are among those Gentiles who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be his holy people, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Alleluia. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel. Alleluia. Please stand for the gospel of our Lord. The Holy Gospel this morning is going to be the basis for the sermon. It's from Matthew chapter 1. This is how the birth of the Messiah, Jesus the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord said through his prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. 
but he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. Please be seated for our next hymn. Grace and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. My brothers and sisters in Christ, as I look back upon those events, it's, it's amazing to me how close I came to doing it. I was ready to sign the papers, so to speak. And, and to think that I... I wanted to do the right thing. I wanted to do the God-pleasing thing. I wanted to do what was right in God's eyes. But if I had done what I was planning to do, I would have done the absolute wrong thing. 
it wouldn't have pleased God at all. I would have been doing the wrong thing for all the right reasons. But you can't blame me for almost divorcing Mary, right? Because after all, it truly is a miracle of God that I came to know what I know now about that child in Mary's womb. I'm sorry, I am getting ahead of myself. I should introduce myself to you this morning. My name is Joseph from the town of Nazareth in Galilee. I'm an Israelite, a Jew from the tribe of Judah. The fact of the matter is that I, I, I came from a pretty prominent family. All of my friends and neighbors knew who were my ancestors were. I'm a descendant of King David, the great king over Israel. But by the time I lived on this earth, uh, a king from David's line hadn't ruled over Israel, over, over Judah for, for 600 years. All that ended in 586 BC when the Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem. And, and by the time I lived on this earth, a thousand years after King David, I, I might have come from a royal family, but there was no pomp and circumstance that followed me around. I was just a, a regular guy. Made my life as a carpenter. But life was good. I was about to be married. I was about to be pledged in marriage to a woman named Mary. Actually, it, officially speaking, Mary already was my wife. We already were officially married in the eyes of the Jewish government. See, marriage in my time and culture was maybe a little bit different than it was in in your time and culture, in your culture, in, in your day, two people who fall in love, who want to be married, they get engaged, right? And, and then they're not officially married during that engagement period, but eventually the day comes when that, that man and that woman, they, they go to the church and they stand before the pastor and all the witnesses at church and they say their I do's. They make their promises to each other and then they sign the official marriage license on that day and that's when they're officially married, right? And, and that's when it's right for a husband and a wife to start living together as husband and wife, to be, to be sexually intimate together as husband and wife, but not before that. That's how it is in your culture, right? Our marriage customs were a little bit different back in our day. So Mary and I knew that we wanted to spend our lives together. We were ready to make our promises to each other. So, so we did. We, we were officially betrothed. We became husband and wife in the eyes of the Jewish government. We were officially married. But in our time and culture, we didn't become, we didn't start living together. We weren't sexually intimate together until after a, a wedding ceremony and a wedding celebration which usually took place about a year after that official betrothal. That's where Mary and I were in our relationship. That, that, that's why St. Matthew in the Gospel talked about how at the same time Mary was my wife, but I was still pledged to be married to her. I was so looking forward to that day when I would take Mary into my home. At least I was looking forward to that day until I made a discovery that completely rocked my world. I found out that Mary was pregnant. That was devastating news because I knew that Mary and I had not been sexually intimate together. We, I thought we were saving ourselves for our marriage. And so I assumed what anyone in my sandals would have assumed. I assumed what was, what was humanly logical, right? I assumed that Mary had been sexually unfaithful to me, that she had cheated on me. I felt so lost. I didn't think that I could take an adulterous woman home to be my wife, so, so I planned on divorcing her. 
You know, in those days, there, there could be some really stiff civil penalties for a person who was unfaithful in a marriage, but I, I didn't want to put Mary through that. You, you, you read how I was a devout Christian who wanted to be faithful to God's law and God's word, so I, I planned on divorcing Mary, but, but doing it quiet, quietly. That was my plan until God revealed his plan to me. And I am so thankful that God revealed his plan to me because there was absolutely no way that I could have ever figured out God's plans to save. And I think that is such an important truth that all of us have to remember all of the time. God's ways are so much greater and higher than our ways. And God's plans to work in our lives, they are things that just go beyond our human reason and our human wisdom because our human wisdom is so, so flawed. My human reason told me that there was only one logical explanation for how my wife Mary got pregnant. And boy, did that lead me in a wrong direction. In the same way, our flawed human logic and reason tells us all that there is only one way that we can get right with God and have a good relationship with him. Our flawed human reason tells us that we have to live a good life and earn our keep with God, earn eternal life with him. And boy, does that lead us in a very wrong direction. The truth of the matter is that we are saved 100% by God and his plan to save us. We are saved 100% by God's grace to us. And the fact that we believe in God's grace and his plan to save us, that too is something that God has gifted to us. Our faith in Christ is 100% a Holy Spirit given gift. It's nothing short of a gift that God has revealed how he's going to save us and that we believe it. And what I came to find out through God's revelation to me was that not only did God have a, a, a special plan for my wife and that child inside of her, but that child inside of her was going to be the redeemer of the world. One night as I was trying to sleep, a restless sleep, thinking about how to handle these divorce proceedings, the Lord sent his angel to me and he told me something extraordinary. He told me that the child conceived inside of Mary was from the Holy Spirit. Mary hadn't been unfaithful to me. Mary was still a virgin. And then I'll never forget what the angel told me next. He said this, she will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. When I woke up and I started contemplating all that the angel had told me, I started seeing why, how this made sense. I mean, not really making sense, right? Like, God's plan to save us? It doesn't make sense to our human reason, right? No, no one could conceive a plan like this by their own reason and strength. No way. But what I mean when I say that this all started making sense, God's plan started adding up to me, I learned how God was, by his grace, planning to use me, why he was planning to use me in his plan to save. See, it, it had to do with the way that the angel addressed me. He, the angel said to me, Joseph, son of David. 
That was no coincidence. That angel was reminding me of who my ancestors were. He was reminding me of King David, my ancient ancestor, and the promises that God had made to King David. That that King David, that the savior of the world was gonna come through his family line. And that that descendant of David was also gonna be a king. Not an earthly king an eternal king, a king who rules in our hearts. I came to see by God's Holy Spirit that God was fulfilling his promises, his greatest promises, right before my eyes and in my family. This child that Mary was carrying was no ordinary child. This child was God. This child was God and a man at the same time. He was Emmanuel, God with us. And when I thought about the name that the angel told me to name that baby, there couldn't have been a more fitting name for him. The angel told me that I was to name that son of mine Yeshua. That's how we say it in our language. You say it in your language, Jesus. But no matter how you pronounce it, it means the same thing. Jesus means the Lord saves. God became a man to be our redeemer and to save this entire world from its sin. So when I got up the next day, I did what was pleasing to God. I did what the angel told me to do. I took Mary home as my wife. And the reason I did that, it can only be described in one way. That was a miracle. To believe this, that's a miracle. I mean, one day I'm thinking that my wife is a cheat and in the next moment an angel is appearing to me and saying, hey, Joseph, don't be afraid. Don't worry about it. The child in her, conceived by the Holy Spirit, he's Emmanuel, God with us. And I believed it. Yes. Because the Holy Spirit had gifted me with a faith that believed in God's promises. That's one of the great miracles of Christmas, the miracle of faith. And it's a miracle that God worked in my heart, and it's a miracle that God worked in Mary's heart, and it's a miracle that God has worked in your heart as well. In a couple of days, we're going to celebrate the birth of this very special God-sent child, Emmanuel, God with us. Thank God that he would love us enough to become one of us, to save us from our sins. But as you do that, as you worship on Christmas, and as you worship today, thank God for another one of his greatest gifts to you. Thank God that the Holy Spirit has come upon you and given you a faith to believe these things. Thank God that you believe that Jesus is your forgiveness and your only hope for eternal life. Amen. Please stand. May the peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's now confess this Holy Spirit given faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. Let's recite together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. 
I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. This time we're going to gather our thank offering. Please also take time to fill out this connection card. Fill it out entirely to make your worship known today. Thank you. Last week, we were encouraged to practice first fruits giving, to put God first, not in theory, but tangibly. This week, we are being encouraged to carefully plan our giving so that we might prayerfully give in proportion to how God has blessed us. Most simply, proportional giving means giving to God a fixed percentage of our incomes. The key to proportional giving is not in a decimal point, but deep-seated trust in Christ and all of his gifts to us. As gratitude to Christ grows, greed withers. As faith in Christ matures, giving blossoms. As grace increases, thanksgiving thrives. Through Christ, gratitude, not greed, is the mark of a Christian life. The Lord has blessed our Wells members in many ways and at various levels. As we continue through our 10 weeks of enhanced giving, some will find giving a tithe, 10% of their income, to be a significant stretch of faith. Others will soon discover that tithing is an excellent starting point for their giving. No matter where you are at in your life of giving, may Jesus richly bless your prayerful, intentional, and proportional gifts this week. It is not unusual for Christians to organize a prison ministry or institutional ministry or ministries focused on serving people who have disabilities. Wells is extraordinary, however. Your congregation mission offerings support the Commission on Special Ministries as it develops and promotes resources for all kinds of compassion ministry. Jesus said that people would know we are his followers by our love. Special Ministries cultivates the kind of love that is not content to ignore the spiritual needs of the one lamb who is deaf, has a developmental disability, or is deployed with the military or is incarcerated. We help Wells members identify people who might not receive the gospel without a special adaptation or effort. When we focus on the needs of a survivor of abuse or the needs of a blind man, we discover that God has also given them gifts to serve in the body of Christ. The people we serve also can be a blessing to their fellow Christians. In these ways, Christ uses our mission offerings to extend his love and your love to others as we learn to serve one another in love. In our prayer of the church today, we're going to remember these special prayers which revolve especially around our congregation. You can, you can find these announcements in the announcements uh, that you can pick up on the way out of church today. We're going to give thanks today for the 62 years of wedded bliss that the Lord has given to Roy and Carol Bantley. We're also going to uh, ask the Lord's blessings upon Ryan Wickman as he continues to deliberate the call to be Luther High's next principal. Also, Pastor Bader, who's deliberating the retirement call to St. John's and Barry Mills. Uh, we'll also give thanks today that Martha Johnson, who was called to Luther, has decided to continue in her present field of service. We'll ask the Lord to bless our outreach efforts around this Christmas season. We'll ask that the Lord would strengthen the faith of Christians all around the world who face persecution, especially those Christians in China who are facing an uptick in persecution right now. We're also going to ask for comfort for the families of Bernice Relic. Bernice Relic went home to heaven a couple weeks ago. The funeral was here at St. Paul's this last week. Also for the family of Robert Schrader, that's Kim Blado's dad. He went home to heaven this last Tuesday. The funeral is tomorrow at Good Shepherd in Holman at 11 o'clock with a visitation beforehand at 9 a.m. Let's pray. Eternal Father, throughout the centuries, you repeated and affirmed your promise to send the offspring of the woman to crush the serpent's head. Through your prophets of old, you continually directed the eyes of your people 
to the advent of their Savior. We praise you, O Lord, for keeping your promise and sending your Son to destroy the works of the devil. As we prepare to celebrate the birth of our King, use your mighty word to shatter our pride and to rouse us from spiritual slumber and apathy. Move us to take to heart the words of John the Baptist, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. You sent your son to redeem us from sin. Let this good news be our joy and strength. Use it to cheer the lonely, encourage the fearful, and give hope to the despairing. In these final days before Christmas, spare us from the deadlines of, from the stress of deadlines and from the frenzy of commercialism and fill our lives with the message of your peace and the music of your grace. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the 62 years of marriage which you have granted to Roy and Carol Bantley. Continue to bless their marriage with faithful love and commitment to each other which conforms to the faithful love which you have shown to us in sending your Son to save. Lord, we ask you to continue to guide the deliberations of Ryan Wickman and Pastor Bader as they consider how and where they might best serve you in the future. And we also ask you to bless the decision of Martha Johnson, who chose to continue to serve in her present field of service. Continue to bless your church with willing gospel servants who share your good news with the world. Bring your comfort to the families of Bernice Relic and Robert Schrader. We trust that all who die with a Holy Spirit given faith in your Son are eternally blessed. And we thank you for the promises of eternal life which Bernice and Robert are now experiencing in your presence. Finally, Lord, bless the proclamation of the Christmas gospel in the coming week, both in our church and throughout our synod and the entire world. Lead many people who do not know your Son to be present in one of our churches so that they might know that the Christ child is their Redeemer from sin and their certain hope. Grant success to our outreach efforts done in your name and for your glory. We also ask that you would especially watch over our Christian brothers and sisters who are persecuted, especially those in China. Give strength to your servants there that they might remain faithful to you and that, in spite of these persecutions, your church might continue to grow. And hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. Come quickly, Lord Jesus, in your grace, in your power, and in your glory. Amen. Please stand and join with me in praying the Lord's Prayer. And we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the singing of our next hymn, and then also please note the, uh, the special instructions for the singing of this hymn. Peace came to earth at last that chosen night When angels clothed the sky with song and light And God in did love and sheathed his might Who could but guess Emmanuel Who could but sing Emmanuel Who could be the same for having held the infant in their arms and later felt the wounded hands and sighed all doubts dispelled? Who could but sigh, Emmanuel? Who could but shout? 
stand for prayer. O Lord God, our Heavenly Father, pour out the Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep us strong in your grace and truth. Protect and comfort us in all temptation and bestow on us your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Please be seated for our closing hymn today. Good morning again. Good to be here to worship with you today. This was good. We should do this all week. And we will. Tuesday, Christmas Eve, services at 4 and 6 o'clock here at St. Paul's. Christmas morning, Christmas Day morning at 9 a.m. I look forward to celebrating our Savior's birth with you and thanking God for the Holy Spirit given faith that we believe these promises. The only other, uh, two, I guess there's two announcements. Um, just like today, next Sunday, there will not be any Bible class here at St. Paul's. Um, and also, in the announcements, there's a, a note about a call meeting for the, the calling of a full-time teacher, and there's more information about that in the, in the bulletin, how, or in the announcements, excuse me. However, there's been a change to the time, so the new date for this call meeting is Sunday, January 26th at 5.30. It's listed as January 19th, but it's Sunday, January 26th at 5.30, and that call meeting is also going to be coupled with a, a facilities needs meeting on that same on that same evening. So more information to follow in the weeks to come, but keep that Sunday, January 6th, 26th date in mind. May the Lord bless you all as you celebrate our Savior's birth.